Guys, welcome back to the Essex Charity Esports Podcast. This is episode number three, and this is going to be a bumper episode. This is going to be a very, very big episode. We've got lots to cover, so I'm going to quickly give you an introduction to everyone, and we'll jump straight into it. So I am, of course, the Esports Manager, your boy, Kingy, John, whatever you want to call me. I'm joined today by the Esports Captain, Regan, the Esports Captain, uh, the Vice Captain, sorry, Larry. And of course, by two of the squad members as well, Ellis and Spencer. Boys, how is everyone? Yeah, all good, thank you. Good. Yep, all here. Yeah, it's, uh, all, all good. here. Good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, of course, as we mentioned in the last episode, uh, there's a lot of talks about referees locally. Um, and a big strike that's impending this weekend. Now, over the last, since the last episode, it's kind of picked up a lot of momentum. And of course, Spence are not only part of the esports team and also the Essex Charity Chairman. He's also a fellow official. So we found it important, as much as we want to get everyone involved in every podcast, we thought it was important to get Spencer on this podcast and to kind of, give his side not of the story but a kind of background into what referees are facing that might have been swept under the rug and it's all just coming out now that referees are facing more and more abuse over the weeks and I think it's just it's time to make a it's time to make a stand and as referees are rightly doing this weekend across Essex and I'm hoping surrounding areas as well is they're doing a strike to make a stand and say, look, without us referees, you've got no game. So I think it's just so important that we get not only Spencer's side of things, but what actually, because we know referees are so vital to like football games, to football leagues, and to essentially making sure that we have got games going across the country. So Spencer, I wanted to get you on today to kind of give your verdict on things as well. Yeah, of course, no problem. I mean, you, you, you pretty much just, just hit the, the nail on the head. The, the only thing that I would say is that, in, in, my, in my opinion, specifically the grassroots game, is that referees are not necessarily vital. Well, they are vital to a certain extent because you can referee a game with a, a mutual referee. You can do that. It, there's, there's no official law to say that you can't. But what you end up having is you, get, you end up having people that referee in a game that don't necessarily know the full extent of the laws of the game. Um, and that's perhaps where that would become a problem and where people generally do need an official referee. Um, so they, they're going to have, they're going to have obviously downsides to that. Now, as, as you said, um, at the moment, there is a massive, massive uh, shortage in officials um, in Essex alone. But I know that's just not Essex. It's, it's cross county in other counties within the UK as well. Um, again, just to put it in perspective, I think they said it's about a 30 odd percent decrease in the amount of officials this year. Um, and if you take those that decrease, um, it's going to end up in about a thousand games across the across the season in multiple different in, across multiple leagues within the Essex region are going to go without an official, which is a massive problem. Um, but the problem does stand down to the abuse that we receive, not just from players, um, but from uh, team officials, from spectators and so on and so forth. Um, and as referees and officials and as organisations, we've just had enough. It's as simple as that. Um, I think I said to you before, John, is that, yes, we get paid for doing what we do, but the financial gain is very, very little. And, we, and, and the 99% of referees out there that referee in grassroots sport, we don't do it for the money, we do it for the enjoyment. So same as any other player when you get up on a Saturday afternoon or you get up on a Sunday morning to go and play your football with your local team. Referees do the same thing. We look forward to going out and providing that service and we look forward to going out and being as fair as you possibly can to both teams. And, 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 let's, and let's, let's get one thing right. Is the referee's not there to be biased to any specific team or individual. 
we're there to uphold the laws of the game the best that we possibly can within our knowledge um we're, we're, we're there to be honest and open and be fair with both teams we're there to um but more important we're there to enjoy it ourselves and and that's it i mean there's a lot of referees that perhaps have come out of playing that want to still be involved and it gives gives individuals the opportunity to do that but the abuse that we're receiving at the moment is just it can't go on um so as as you said there's there's a, a strike with a local referees or uh, referees association and bearing in mind there's 60 70 referees within that association this weekend that are going to be boycotting and they have said that they specifically will not be refereeing any fixtures this weekend again so if you take that in consideration with the existing shortage that there already is plus the strikes that are going to be happening with the referees association that i'm involved with and i can tell you now other associations will follow there's going to be a hell of a lot more games than originally anticipated that are going to go without an official and until teams and players realize that referees will not stand for it it's going to continue so it's going to continue to get worse in my opinion um but it's it's something that's got to be done um we will we'll lose money don't get me wrong but as i said we, we're not there for the money we're there to enjoy the game and no one wants to no one no one wants to walk out of their door on any day during the week and receive abuse for doing something that they love um and it's just as simple as that really um I myself, unfortunately, as I said, I've been refereeing for, for quite some time. I came out of it for a while, but I'm back into it now. I never thought that I'd experience any type of abuse, um, but unfortunately, it was last week and that I, I did receive that. Unfortunately, I, I got threatened, um, not physically, but verbally in quite, quite a strong manner. And it does, it does leave you feeling quite vulnerable um, as an individual because you have to remember is that there's 22 blokes that are playing football there, but it's only you. So you are on your own. There's no one there to support you. So it does leave you vulnerable um, and also put you in a little bit of a precarious situation that sometimes that you do, you do worry for your own safety. Um, and that shouldn't happen. Why, why should that be happening? Why should a referee have to worry about his own safety when all he's doing is going out to help local grassroots football? He's going out to enjoy the game that he loves as well. And he's leaving that particular area of that particular game perhaps not wanting to referee anymore. I think that's really, really sad. Um, I don't know what you feel about that. I, to be honest, I don't think I can add much to what you've just said. Um, I think you're spot on. Like, a lot needs to change, um, especially as you say. Essentially, it's 22 guys against one person and you're just there to not even do a job because I don't believe anything's a job if you enjoy it, but it's, you're there to serve purpose as to be an official, to officiate the game and to call it right down the middle. And if you do make a mistake or not even a mistake, because it's not necessarily have to be a mistake, but something that a certain player doesn't agree with or a team doesn't agree with, then it just puts you in such a vulnerable position where you're not there for that. You're there to, as you say, enjoy what you're doing to essentially as well help out these teams because you're giving up your time to go and ref for them. So they've got a game that is played by the laws of the game. And yeah, it's just, I think quite frankly, it's disgusting and a lot needs to change, but... It is, it is disgusting. And the, the, only, the only other thing that I could probably say on it is that I completely understand frustration on a football pitch. I understand frustration in any walks of life. And I don't mind players getting frustrated on the football pitch because, quite frankly, that's natural. Um, but there becomes a very, very fine line between frustration and either physical or verbal abuse. And they're, they're two very, very, very different things. Um, and I think also the other part of the problem is that as a player, you think you know everything about the law of football. And I can tell you now that perhaps this might, might go down for any of you guys. It's not until you do perhaps a referee's course that you find out there is a lot that you didn't know about football. So to be as fair, referee I have no intention of doing that. I've seen the abuse that some people get. I'm, I'm not down for that. The thing is, you can't act out. 
you've got to stand and you've got to take that. Yeah. It's, um, I'm too... And whatever else, but no, it's, no what they go through is just wrong. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to referee. I'm never going to walk away from refereeing. I'm a strong enough character to, to not let abuse like I received affect me. Um, I'm not saying that it won't down the line. Um, I'll be open and honest and say that I suffer with mental health as well. And I physically feel I'm strong enough not to let, I'm going to say it, like a mindless thug, which is what they are, affect me like that. But what I would be worried about is if there is someone that perhaps is not as strong mentally, or even if there's a younger referee, or in some circumstances, a female referee that could potentially feel a lot more vulnerable than someone that's perhaps not as strong. And that, that's what worries me. And until the FA actually impose further and harder sanctions and punishments on these players, I don't think the abuse is going to stop. I think any report of abuse, no matter whether it's verbally, physically, or any type of abuse in that kind of nature, that individual should receive a lifetime ban, in my opinion, no matter what it is, whether it's against an official or any other member of the team or an spectator. Why should they be allowed to carry on playing the game that they that they supposedly love, but think it's the right to abuse other individuals at the same time? It's wrong, and it needs to stop. And I myself, I, I will be standing by my fellow referees this weekend and, and, and joining the boycott. I won't be refereeing any fixtures, and I can tell you for now, I've had about fifteen requests already this week. This week, um, and that just and I, I know a lot of referees have got so many requests as well. So. There's going to be a mass shortage this weekend, but again, until until the FA pull their finger out and actually act upon this, then what else can we do, really? And that and that and that's it. Um, Spencer, just just to jump in there, um, I think you've raised loads of really good points there, and I, I completely get why the, uh, the sort of the protest is happening, and hopefully that will sort of force people to reassess the way they're treating referees. But I guess a question for me and maybe for anyone else that's listening to the podcast, what can, say, normal football players like myself, so say I was playing on a, a Saturday, is there anything you think that, you know, the, the, the 80 the 90% of the good players who do just want to turn up for a football game, is there anything that they can do to help sort of empower you as a referee or anyone when those sort of situations arise? It, yeah, again, it comes down to how the, the club officials themselves, what, what are they saying to their players? What are they, it, 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 as a, like, um, if I was to run a Saturday or a Sunday league club, for example, I would not have any type of abuse towards an official. And it, it comes down to what are these clubs doing against these individuals? Because they're clearly at the moment just letting them get away with it. I personally would not want something or want someone that's going to act in that behaviour, a part of my club that could potentially damage the re not only the reputation, but could potentially get you kicked out of the league as well. Um, so it goes down to clubs enforcing um, their own disciplinary procedures in regards to that as well. Um, it can fall down to captains. Um, there is a big part, again, I'm not just putting it down, but referees need to obviously set a precedence during the game as well. As I think, as I said before, referees don't have a problem in you questioning a decision if it's done in the right way. If you're going to shout and scream at a referee from 50 yards away, then that's when it becomes a problem because that's when the rule of descent comes in play. So it's just, it, so for me personally, it's down to how the clubs themselves are implementing certain procedures to protect football as a game, not just the officials, but football as a game, I, I, I believe. If that makes sense. <laughs> I know it does. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of different ways that basically other people can still help and assist. Because I think you, you're never going to be able to get rid of, I guess, everyone in football. I mean, you know, anyone can turn up to a game and have a hot, heated moment and say something they regret. But I think you're right. It comes down to how can overall as an organisation, how can teams and how can leagues help support referees? You know, whether that be, you know, if you can sense that someone's getting a bit heated or a bit hot-headed, you know, is that a responsibility of the captain or the manager to sort of realise that situation beforehand and say, this player's going to lose their head, let's remove them from the situation and take them out of the game or, or sub them off. You know, yeah, I think well, that, that, that can come down to referee, and I have done that in the past as well, and I Again, it, again, it's how the referee views the game. If he can see someone that's getting a little bit hot-headed, then perhaps what we, what I do as referee, I, I will pull a captain in and I will just say, look, this player's getting a little bit hot-headed. 
keep an eye on him, have a word, or perhaps just just substitute or whatever you need to do, just to keep the integrity of the game is, um, and not ruin the game. Um, so it's, referees do have a responsibility to to manage the game in that retrospect as well. But there's only so much we can do. The rest of it relies down on the club itself. Um, as I said, we're, we're there to enforce. The, the laws of the game and it's, it's as simple as that we're not there to be biased we're there we're there to do a job but again we're there to enjoy it and yeah you know i mean and it's it's just unfortunately some players don't understand rules the rules maybe and again get frustrated over certain decisions um referees get things wrong it's natural it happens we, we're not in the professional game we don't have the technology to help us out um i mean all, all, all i say to players is that look if you're not happy with a, a decision that I've made, I'm not asking you to agree with it. I'm just asking you to get on with it. Do you know what I mean? I'll explain my decision. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree. Just get on with it. Just to go and enjoy the game. That's all it's you need to do. A classic saying, isn't it? The referee is not going to change their mind. You know, no one's going to be able to come up to you and get you to change your mind by having a moan. So what's the point of moaning in the first yeah. place? It's just always going to happen. You're always going to have 11 players that are happy and you're always going to have 11 players that are unhappy at certain things. That's, that's, the, that's the game. You're never, going to, you're never going to get rid of that. But abusing someone for, abusing someone for a decision or, you know I mean, referees have bad games. I've had bad games. You know what I mean? I, I'm a referee that will openly hold my hands up to if I've made a mistake. You know what I mean? Doesn't mean I'll change my decision. But if I make a mistake, I'll hold my hands up. But just get on with it. That's all we are. Just get on and enjoy the game that you, that you. More importantly, these players pay to play as well. They pay to the, play. The thing is, like with refs in football, I mean, you start. You look at the Premier League. Not one of them wants to put a mic on like the rugby refs do. Rugby refs get a lot of respect, right? Yeah, they they do have their moments where they mess up, but you know they, they've got the video thing, like the professionals do like for football. But with the rugby lot, they, they're willing to mic up. They're willing to let the conversations be broadcast. They they are willing to go, right, this is what is going on. This is what the rules are. Yeah. comes to football, the refs don't want to do that. I, I don't yeah. know why. But no, it's, I, I don't, I, I'm not I, sure I, if that's going to help going forward because then that I, way they, they get the respect and then obviously it's a train. I mean, you watch professional football and then you see the refs are getting respect and it's like, you go to a Saturday Sunday, it's like, it may change. I'm not saying it will, but... You know, it could it, it could have you. a positive impact, you know? I'll, I'll correct you slightly on that. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, if you look at professional rugby or even any grassroots rugby, the referees don't receive any type of abuse. There's an etiquette towards uh, officials on a rugby field. For example, you can call a ref by his first name, not that many would allow, or you can call him ref. On a rugby pitch, yeah. you have to call the ref sir. You yeah. have to do it on a rugby pitch. So it shows a certain etiquette. In rugby, refs, uh, in rugby officials can be mic'd up, cameraed up, and so on and so forth. So again, it's protecting them. But again, it's for their own training as well, more than anything. Now, a lot of football officials are calling for referees to be allowed to have body cameras and to be allowed to have microphones on them as well. Now, believe it or not, it's actually in the laws of the game that the referee is not allowed to wear any type of uh, electrical um, system apart from a, a communication system. So although us as referees are calling for it, we're being stopped by the laws of the game because they won't allow us to have it. Right, that's something I didn't know. Fair I enough. But, no. you know, it's just, it, sorry, it just seemed like it would be something that would help referees going forward to you know because you, you you see it as the respect that they get for doing the job that oh, not really job but you, you know what i mean for what they're doing and then because you're seeing kids growing up now and they're seeing that as professionals are abusing them i think oh yes yeah, fine to do it's not mm. and it's not. i just think it could have a positive impact just um just to chip in there i mean i guess there's two points you, you sort of raised there i think the first one you you know i guess the slight difference between rugby and football is that you get a lot less grey areas with rugby um, and there's a lot more camera angles to watch everything that happens. Um, but I think 
you know Spencer really hit the nail on the head which is you know we can do all these things to try and help referees but the whole reason why rugby has a completely different culture and attitude towards refs is because it is that it's the culture it's brought into the game it's in every club it's in the etiquette it's in the way that you taught rugby from a young age that you don't argue with the referee and that it's the decision you get on on a rugby pitch if the if, if you gave the referee grief no one on your team's going to turn around and go, oh, yeah, nice man, nice one, mate, well done. You're, you're looked down upon, it's seen as a negative. Whereas you look at football and you could argue that someone giving it the big into to the referee, the, the lads on your team, the other lads on the other team, it's, it's almost encouraged. So I, I think that the, the Yeah, big I just don't see yeah, why it can't be done from both. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even if you, if, you, if you look at a football stadium, or like, for example, if you look at the fans... They're all segregated into their separate separate stands or areas. Now, yeah. if you look at a rug, if you look at a rugby match, how often do you see two sets of fans sitting together having a beer and enjoying the game? You see it quite. No, often. To be fair, I've done it quite a lot. It's, yeah. It is what it is. You, 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 that eighty minutes, you're ribbing them. Yeah. So you, you, you the, drink a beer with them. It's, the, the abuse doesn't just sit with the players. It's a broader issue in the football game. Yeah, it is. But the thing is, is like. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, uh, if you're playing football from young age, the same as you play rugby from young age, you get told, don't, obviously don't get on the rest back, don't do anything, just, just, you got a problem, you, you speak, right? Which, fair yes. enough. Why can't people do that in football? Say, look, don't get on his back, doing what you can. If you have a problem, you go up and you speak to him, or you speak to me and I'll speak to him, kind of thing, you know? You, and then as you get older, you you have that respect, like they do. I know it's two different sports, and I know it's two different whole things, but you have that respect, and it, and it teaches you to have respect for other people for what they do, not jump on them. Yeah, and, and until that changes, and until clubs adopt the same attitude towards their own players, it's going to continue. And unfortunately, that, that is just the case, and you're going to see more and more referees being... Pushed, not pushed out of the game, but dropping out of the game because, again, no one wants to walk out of their door on a Sunday morning, come home and feel, Jesus Christ, I've just been threatened or I've just been headbutted or whatever it might be. No one wants that. And then, and until, both, until both the clubs themselves can adopt their own disciplinary action to try and stop the abuse towards officials and the FA come out and start handing out harsher punishments, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's as simple as that. So, There's two yeah, good points I want to touch on, actually, that have come up. So, one, about, I think Regan brought it up about at a young age, you're taught to not get on the referee's back and things like that. However, now I've refed youth games. I refed youth games when I was like 18. And not, obviously, the players, I'm not scared of anyone that's like five, six years old. But... When, parents. yeah, the parents, <laughs> the abuse you receive from the parents mm -hmm. is disgusting. Yeah. And all the kids looking at is, oh, well, my dad's having a go at this ref. And in their yeah. mind, they might not be thinking it at the time, but in their mind, you think, all right, well, that's what you're like now. What's your kid going to grow up like? And then the cycle repeats itself. Because when that kid's older and playing open age football, they're giving the abuse to the refs. And when it comes their turn to bring their kids to football, they're abusing the refs. And it's like, well, you can teach yeah. the kids at a young age that are playing the game to not get on the refs back. But I think yeah. equally, more needs to be done about the parents. And this has been something that's been brought up for years and years. Um, 100%. I totally agree. And that, that is the reason why I refuse to referee youth football. Yeah, I will not yeah. do it. It's, it's not the, it's I mean, not because the, play, the, the players, the, or the kids, I should say, at that level... They're there to, to learn the game, play with a smile on their face, which you do see. But the abuse that comes from the sideline from, from parents, it's embarrassing. Yep. It's disgusting. You know what I mean? It's, and bearing in mind, referees at that level, you can be 14 and referee at that level. And if you've got a big burly parent coming up to you and threatening you in an under under 12s game for example Ooh. yeah yeah it, who's it, gonna win and it, it, it happens it happens believe me and it happens more than off, more than often um and the abuse generally does happen more in youth football than it does in open age i can I imagine can, i can promise you that and john as you said you've been in that situation so you yeah. know 
Um, and that that is the whole reason why I, I, I don't referee youth football, because I'm not going to stand there and take abuse from a parent who he could be 60 yards away and he's questioning a decision that's in the penalty area at the other end. What, what gives him the right to question that when he's nowhere near it? Yeah, I mean, it becomes it becomes all about that's my child. You know what I mean? He, he did this. You know what I mean, I, I want my child to be the best. Again, this is it. About the team. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. It's not about they don't agree with the decision. It's that oh, my son's been fouled in the penalty area and you've not give it or vice versa. My son's committed a foul in the penalty area and you've give it. My son wouldn't do that. It's all about yeah. their kid is perfect. I say son, obviously, you get girls playing youth football as well. It's very mixed at that age. Uh, but, yeah, it's all about, well, my kid's perfect. So why are you penalising them? Or why haven't you penalised the opposing player for fouling my kid? And it's like, well, yeah. there's, yeah. I, and I think that's the worst thing. They're not disagreeing with your decision. Well, they are to an extent. But they're not disagreeing with your decision they're disagreeing with the decision that's gone for or against their child. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I said to a fellow colleague of mine, a referee, the other day, I said, in in youth football, it's going to get to the point where um, adults are going to be asked to drop their children off, then leave, and then pick them up when the game yeah. is finished. That's what it's going to come down to if they don't it's stop. It's sad, isn't it? It's so it sad. sad because it's if, I, if I was a child, I'd, I'd want my mum, my dad, my nan, my granddad, whoever to come and watch me. Do you know what I mean? It means a lot when you're at that level. And if they can't do that, again, it's not, it's the children that are, get, it's the children that are losing out and getting punished because of their own, yeah. their parents' own poor behaviour and attitude towards the game. I guess that's where it comes back to your point, though, around you know, top down and culture, because like you said, it's probably, again, it's not the majority of parents. Let's face it. There's always that there's always one or two parents who consistently come to games who are always the same culprits, given the referees grief. And until, you know, from the very top down, it's ingrained into the culture of football that that's not acceptable. So mm -hmm. other parents are feeling comfortable enough to ask that parent not to attend games because they're ruining it for their children, for all the kids. It's going to be very hard to change that. And I guess that's why stuff like, you know, this protest and this this sort of walkout happening is, is, is good because it's going to draw more attention to it and hopefully get people paying more attention to stuff like that. It will be, but it also goes, I mean, if we just go back to, for example, physical violence where uh, an official gets assaulted physically, the, 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 the problem is, is that no one wants to take ownership for it. Um, and I, I'd say the reason why. So because if you report a team or an individual for physical assault on an official, what the FA actually do is they see that as a police matter. Oh, wow. Then, then what the police do, because it's happened on a football field, the police see it as an FA matter. So nobody wants to take ownership of this. So there's that miscommunication there and that, that fail in the process of there is who deals with this. In my mind, if you're going to assault anybody, whether it be an official or someone else, the disciplinary action in terms of the football environment should be done by the FA, but why should he not also have criminal matters brought brought against him by the by the by the police? Why can the two not work hand in hand? And it's just the both that don't want to take ownership of a specific situation, um, because in my view, it's too much paperwork and too much hard work for him probably. But this is the yeah, thing. I agree with you on that, abuse though. is abuse, though. Like it doesn't matter if it happens on a football pitch or if it happens in the street. What are you going to do if? You have a fight at a pub or there's two blokes having a fight in a pub. What are the police going to say? Oh, well, it happened in your premises. So it's down to the pub to mm -hmm. discipline both of them. That's ridiculous. Like if it happens on a football pitch, if it happens on the street, abuse is abuse. So that's a criminal offence. And surely that's a police matter to deal with. Yeah. And it just winds me up because I reported it to the FA. And don't get me wrong, the FA are, are good in terms of what they can and can't provide. But you send your report off, you email, you, you do, and you, you send it to league. And all you get back is, oh, if you're struggling with your mental health, if you're struggling with your mental health, if you're struggling with your mental health, stop giving me the same, excuse my language, same old bullshit. You know what I mean? Not one person from the FA or the league has picked up the phone to call me and ask if I'm all right. Yeah. 
it's ticking boxes, isn't it? Unfortunately, a lot. I think yeah. with the focus on mental health, you get a lot of businesses, organisations that genuinely do take it seriously, and then you have others that it's perception. They need to be perceived as taking it. So, like you said, they the question, but they won't take any action against the people who were causing it, and neither have they actually checked in with you to actually make sure you're doing okay. So again, it comes all back to that point of top down. They need to do more to support referees and make it a safer environment for, for you guys to, to referee the games. Yeah, yeah but until it... someone has that breakdown or has something completely wrong from like the abuse that's either physical or not physical sort of thing, until that person has that meltdown and it all goes completely out and people know about it, that's when it's going to happen because until people do have that meltdown or until people have just gone, look, like, we ain't taking this no more. We'll be taking a stand of like for a weekend of saying, look, we ain't doing it. It's showing the bigger yeah. picture of this is what we get and we're not sticking up for it. You need to do something. And, you know, full credit. Yeah. But they I, do I, need I, to do I, something better for you. I'll tell you a scary statement that someone said to me the other day. And this is this is really, and we can probably just end on this note because this is going to say it all. Um, and this really does put things in perspective of how bad the abuse is. A referee came out and said a statement the other day. He said, at the moment, the abuse is so bad within the game. Um, he believes that he's not going to stop until either a referee is seriously injured or killed yeah. in a game. Oh, no, I agree. How, it's probably how, bad, how bad is that? It's going to take potentially an innocent official to be killed for people to stand up and take note of the abuse that we're receiving. The sad thing is, I 100% believe that to be true as well. That's the yeah. ridiculous yeah. thing is that that is how, and this is a conversation that kind of come up in work. We were talking about health and safety and that it's weird that you don't get all these rules until something happens. It takes something to happen for action to happen. And unfortunately, I see that being the same case with refs and it's a joke. You'd think that they've got the right opportunity now to take action before something serious occurs. Mm -hmm. And again, that brings me back to the second point that was brought up actually about, um, which I didn't know that obviously I've not seen, I've not ref for a long time, but about referees not being able to wear, not being able to wear electrical equipment. Now, surely if referees wanted to, I'm not saying that the FA goes out and buys everyone a GoPro, but if referees wanted to and they've got the facility to do so, why can't they have a GoPro that captures that footage and then when you're making a report of any abuse that you have to report, you've got evidence to say, look, this is what happened. This is the player in question. This is the team in question. And surely the FA then can say, right, well, we've got the evidence. We don't need to take statements. We've got the evidence there and we can make a stand. We can make a decision on what disciplinary action we now take. Yeah, I totally agree with that because at the moment what happens, it's 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 worse than word. So basically you'll put a report in, they'll investigate it, they'll get a report from the other player and the other player will make up some bullshit story. And then the FA look at it and go, well, he said that, he said that. And because there's no witness statements, it'll get away with it, unfortunately, yeah. no matter what the issue. Now, I'm quite fortunate in my scenario that I was actually contacted by the away team directly who phoned me and said, we heard what that referee was said. We are willing to make a statement and we are willing to put our name against it. So I'm quite lucky in that retrospect. A lot of other referees haven't. And a lot of players are getting away with it because it's wordful. It's, you know, I mean, it's his word against your word. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, but a lot of referees have been calling to allow, to allow for body cameras, GoPros, microphones, whatever it is. But if we are seen to wear one, in a match, we'll get fined. It's ridiculous. I, that honestly disgusts me. The fact it, that for one thing that could could possibly, you know, cause referees a lot more reassurance, they've got that thing to say, right, well, actually, if I get abused, all right, it's still a rubbish situation to be in, but I've got this now as a backup. It. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that the laws of the game don't allow that, I think needs to be changed and it needs to be changed fast. And I'll tell you what, if we were allowed to wear a body camera or a GoPro, as you said, John, 
I guarantee you, the abuse on the football field will stop. Yeah. Because it will act as an, a deterrent. Yeah, hundred percent. It will act. As See, a I don't think it will stop, right? Because the thing is, you, you know, you always get that one player on every team that just constantly does it every game. Mm. Now you're still going to have them. But it will calm the whole situation down. There won't be as much abuse. You you still get that hot head and that one that thinks he's funny and that one that just doesn't care that just turns up that wants to annoy the ref all game every game. Yeah, you get that. Yeah, he, he, he's still going to be there and he's still going to do it. But the thing is, once all that abuse calms down and he's still doing it, you just go, well, "Look, mate, you're the only one left. This time that you you know it's time you go. It's and the FA can look and go right. Well, you still got a couple of these people. Just ban them." whatever it is, you can then just ban them from doing it because clearly all that's left, once the, like the electrical equipment comes in, well, I think it should come in and, you know, you are allowed to use it, the law should change on that. Is mm-hmm. basically, you, you, you're weeding out the people that are there just to do the wrong thing yeah. and it and changes just, the game and it changes the respect that people get. It does, yeah. And you know what, when, in the incident that I had last week, my, my other half was watching me on the sideline. And she had to see the commotion that was going on against me in the centre circle. And that upset her to see that to see that I was having to deal with that and be subjected to that. You know what I mean? So not only has it potentially affected me, it could have potentially affected my missus as well if something worse was to happen. Do you know what I mean? So, but it, it is what it is. But I mean, the statement, the last statement about it's, it's going to take something serious for potentially teams and players to actually stand up and think, do you know what? This is bang out of order. I think maybe that, you know, I mean, unfortunately, that that's going to happen, and that that's the reason why a lot of referees don't want to go out. Who wants to go out and referee a game with the potential that this they could get killed? Nobody wants it, um, and that and that's the reason why I'll be sticking by the ball boycott. I won't be refereeing this weekend, and I'll be doing everything I can to support my fellow referees um, until this is a uh, is till something's done about it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, spot on, spot on. Actually, there's one thing I do want to, because I, I don't play football myself, but uh, I mean, I've only, and I don't really go to many matches because I'm terrified of, like, especially with the lower stuff, it can be quite, you know, aggressive and seeing what some of the views yeah. I've seen. So I've only recently been to one match, which was ironically the Essex Charity football match, which I must admit, I quite enjoyed at the time and really do. And um, no, I think, it, no, it definitely needs to change. But as well as that, I swear many years ago, they did try and do something with like parents with like some glass. Like wall thing protecting, like saying about like don't abuse the referees or abuse other people, as well as how what when was that rule changed or when was that rule put in and when was it last changed about no. the electronics? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it, I think it's been there for quite some time. I mean, you can have a communication device, but you only use them in the professional game anyway. You don't use them at grassroots. But in in, in Saturday League, in Open Age Saturday League, for example, and all youth games, you have to have what you call a respect barrier, which nine times out of 10 is just a rope that's a certain distance put around the pitch. Now, parents and every other spectator has to stand behind that that line, but they jump over it. They abuse over the top of it. (laughs) It's pointless. It is absolutely pointless. But there we go. Perfect, yeah, so... Spencer has had to duck out, but I just want to say a massive thank you to Spencer for joining us and, you know, letting us delve deep into the topic on the referee abuse. Um, Ellis as well, bringing up some really good points. But yeah, honestly, I certainly think it's time to make a change and hopefully... It's need changing. Yeah, that's it. Hopefully this boycott at the weekend is going to be the start of that, but we'll have to see. We'll be keeping a close eye on that. But yeah, Larry, fill us in. What has been going on in the gaming world? Oh boy, <laughs> seriously. Unbelievable amount of stuff that's come around uh, as well as, I mean, there's been more news on the Paradox Interactive situation. Uh, some are now accusing the company of of silencing discrimination, which wow. like, nearly everything is doing. I mean, that's everything that's going around that, so I'm not surprised. But the two that are coming up, one um, that I have done a lot of research on, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the first thing I'm talking about is to do with China. Now, some of you may have seen this on the news that uh, China have decided anyone under their 18, they're only allowed to play video games 
for an hour a day uh, on basically Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and maybe on another hour on a holiday in China uh, to basically they, uh, they believe it's like too much. They are a lot of people play it. I mean, they compare gaming in China to opium, and which then led to when that was announced that the stock of Tencent, who owned the quite a lot of companies, to plummet about 20%. Jeez. Which is, I mean, quite, I know it was, it was mad. I don't know what people's opinions on this hour a day thing is. I think I'd struggle to survive if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, one hour a day, I don't think, mm, yeah, no, nah. I don't think so. Somehow, I feel like it's just a classic cliche, isn't it? It's just one extreme to the other. Um, I don't. I don't think I've got a problem with them, a country trying to, you know, put some restrictions in place to stop people who clearly have, maybe have an issue um, or maybe spending far too much time. You know, you do hear of, you know, oh, some yeah. kids oh, yeah. nowadays spending 12, 13 hours a day on a console, not going outside. But it does seem ludicrous to go from, you know, we haven't got any restrictions in place to we're going to physically limit someone to going for one hour. Um, I mean, that's one Call of Duty update and you're, you're not getting on the game for a week. No, so. that's what I was thinking about was like, is it to do with in-game? Is it just to be on the console? Is it including up? I, I do admit, no, that was one thing. I must admit, I don't mind it for like youngsters because obviously you don't want to keep like four, five, six year olds like playing it for youngsters, but maybe what, like changing the hours per like age, like when it gets about, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe dropping it to about, I don't know, four or five hours or something a day or something. Or giving option to do that but also i will say china have been very strict with their games consoles i mean they've only allowed consoles re i think until very recently the last probably four or five years they've sort of allowed it but it basically means that any esports players from china has to come outside of it so i because i don't also know if it's going to include hong kong as well because i think they're technically part of china so i don't know if hong kong's are also involved with that rule set as well Hmm. Very, very contentious Hong Kong. Anyway, <laughs> so well, I think yeah. if there's any e gamers there, I think they'll they'll definitely be running a running a mile. Um, oh yeah, it just, it just yeah. seems. I feel I just think it's wrong for any adult. I mean, to to force the impose if someone wants to choose their time passing their time doing that, you know, that's their decision. Um, so I do find it quite quite unusual but yeah i, I i've heard about this but i, I didn't realize the, the level of detail so to be fair yeah, for me and a few others sorry dude um that like gaming is like an escape of reality it's like you, you you enter this whole new world i mean you meet people through gaming by talking to them or like you become decent friends with certain people around the world and like having the time to game it just gives you that time where you can just be you you can just do whatever you want kind of thing you can create a character and be whatever you know it's and then to have that limited from you it's just like what happens no. some people yeah. go into the world of gaming as, a, as an escape i mean i've used it plenty of times as an escape to reality so i, I didn't want to know anything it was just it was gaming it's what you're into yeah, yeah. No, I should say to any parent who is watching this, there are mm. systems you can put in place, especially on I know on PlayStation. I think even Xbox, you can put placements of like setting amount of times of how much they uh they can play. Like I think you can do it, especially with consoles. I know you can do like you can send them an hour, hour and a half, and it will tell you and it will set out. I mean, it won't cut you off. I will make that clear because I think in cases like just in case of instances of games taking longer than expected or it takes time to load in and stuff so it does give you time it just tells you how long and how maybe how long it goes off on off after so let's say they play an hour like two hours they'll tell you okay he's playing now 30 and then 40 minutes over or whatever what so so it is plausible i mean it, we do have sort of that but it's just not as a government thing i think although yuki i think have set kind of things well this is how long you should probably allow your kids to be playing on all that just not government ruled yeah, I, I mean, I agree. And I think Regan touched on quite a good point, really, which is, you know, look, through coronavirus and the lockdown, you know, I, I've just moved to a new city. You know, when, when you move to a new place or you're in an area and you can't go out, um, it's a form of escapism to take you away from what's going on outside, but it's a way of staying in touch. Um, I probably haven't seen Regan face to face in ten years, but I'm playing on a computer game. To, I'm playing on a computer game and chatting to him as if like no time's passed whatsoever. 
So I, I get that there's a lot of things around, you know, people getting addicted to computer games and spending too long. Um, and just like any other addiction, you know, you don't see people stop selling beer or an alcohol just because there's alcoholics out there. I think it's about, you're right, putting the right support metrics in place and giving people options. Um, yeah, whereas this just seems like, well, we know some people are going to have issues with computer games, so therefore no one can play them across the entire country. It seems quite a, a, a broad brushstroke, really, to, to tarnish everyone yeah. under the same brush. Yeah. Well, the next story, which is it actually affects here in the UK, in fact, because Peggy, as many of you may know, uh, does the racing board for the video games in the UK, have basically changed the rules or basically decided to be less lenient on a certain law over gambling or more the point mainly on slot machines from our games so such games as pokemon i've had it and i think even mario super mario Bros. on ds has had it i think even i've heard mention of mario 64 using stuff like slot machines or ways of like using cards like poker or um i think like snap and stuff anything if they were released now there won't be threes or twelves or seven or sevens. They will be now classified as eighteens. However, this may be starting to people to believe, oh yeah, it's going to include all the FIFA, the Madden, the NBA 2K's kind of ultimate team side. Um, no, they're not classifying that. In fact, I actually contacted them over this to find out exactly why. Now, I have had a response, and I have it on screen here with me because it's quite interesting. It's bit of a jargon so uh, they uh, they said uh, basically uh, the age rating associated with peggy gambling's criteria has indeed changed and all newly released games that feature gambling will now be rated peggy 18 whereas peggy 12s used to be possible to certain cases however the gambling criteria itself has not changed and still does not apply to two nba 2k while nba 2k 22 for example uses a visual deception of slot machines like reels and when players win a jackpot, players cannot actually use a slot machine the way that they would in real life. As such, it does not meet our gambling criterion. The possibility to purchase items using real money is covered by the Peggy description in in-game purchases and the notice that game includes random items. Basically meaning our rules are too uh, old-fashioned that they can't put them under even though they have pachinko machines and slot machines. I think that's what I'm getting through that. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It sounds to me just like they've realised they've got to do something with all the media focus and attention on basically what is essentially gambling for kids. And um, But they've tried to find some gal clauses on some of the main games and bring them in the income. Um, I can't remember who it was. Someone was telling me on FIFA Ultimate Team that they actually make 80% of their revenue from FIFA Ultimate Team packs. I think, yeah, no, I have heard that. It's that's more than 80%. It is more than 80. It literally, with nice. FIFA Ultimate Team, EA makes so much money, and the same from Madden, and I think the same from like 2K with their basketball. They make too much money from that that they don't want to change it because it's it's the way it's, it's a cash cow to them. It's the way oh, that they go. Yeah. Well, this person's going to spend 500 quid, whether that'll be throughout the year, in a month, whatever. Then someone else, oh, they're going to spend about a grand. Why, why should we bother to hold that back when you're looking at it, right? You've got adults that are doing it. Kids are then potentially asking their parents for money on there, whether it be that or not. Fortnite is another prime example with the like the V-Bucks because there's new skins coming out. So then the kids want money to get the new skin. No matter Fortnite, what Fortnite, I would say, is a bit different because with least with yeah. Fortnite, you know what you're getting. With yeah, ultimate team, not, it's I'm like you staying. have no idea. Although they are about yeah, to change but, that with twenty two, they do allow you to open the back and then go, do you want it or do you not want it? Kind of. Thing. Yeah, but the but thing I, is, it's 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 the money that is being invested into games that you know you still essentially you're throwing money at a game and like yeah, Fortnite yeah is 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 different. But the fact is, it's kids going, mom, dad, can I have some money? I want to get this. But with yeah. FIFA, yeah, ultimately, yeah, it is gambling because you don't know what you're getting. You know, you're buying packs. But like I said, adults are doing it. And then oh, obviously yeah, you're no. getting the kids to do it. And then the thing is, um, you, you don't know what's going to happen, whether they draw the line. They can make a game 18. But the thing is, how many adults are going to go to the kid? Oh, you can't have that because it's 18. 
they're well, not no, it's because... not no no it's not only that i mean there would be a lot of parents because i know a lot of parents they will allow i know a lot of parents don't allow when i was a kid they didn't allow me to play 18s when i was very young and i know a lot of parents would but i think with something like this it's a way of a barrier i think if they did do this on the that because it means that they go okay maybe not and it would because they know they'll lose more money if they because 18 though or like some shops don't sell 18s but um also i i should actually say we believe we know how this has happened the rule change or the things kind of ch like changed a bit was because of a youtuber known as angry joe we are all joe vargas some may know him some may not when they i think it was when they, they had i think it was in it was originally in 2k19 they added the pachinko and the slot machines and he went like completely ragey over to espn over this and i think he also did mention peggy for the whole system and he put up a meeting he immediately actually said uh, talking about the pokemon situation with the pokemon red i think it was blue that had the slot machines and him saying like look you allow that to be in and yet you're saying that this isn't and that's i think people have gone uh you might have a point here and that's why they've changed the rules as quickly as they have because i think he meant to step up two years ago so it's a bit suspicious jeez I think, I mean, yes, there's two two points there, isn't there? I mean, the first one is looking at people under 18. So are you encouraging people? And let's face it, we, we probably all know someone who's an adult who's over 18 who's got an issue with gambling. Are you creating bad habits in young kids that's going to later affect them in life, let alone, you know, the cost it's going to cost their parents? But are you creating bad habits and issues around gambling, which is something that's very... Uh, topical anyway and then the second point is if you are over 18 and you're gambling on even a, a gambling website you go on paddy power you go on betfred you go on these websites they have to have warnings they have to have support measures in place they have to have limits you can place onto these things to basically try and show that they're doing something about gambling but when it comes to these oh, games they're not there's nothing, there's nothing there so yeah. you can have someone who get carried away and before you know it they spend 500 pounds in their monthly allowance on a game and there was no measures in place to try and stop them oh no that's the thing because they've uh i know because the, the amount of stories you hear of parents or more of the kids spending thousands of pounds or parents without knowing and trying to get one player and then never getting it which is I, because now they have to show the potential of it of a player you are able to get, which is pretty slim of ones you want. But not only that, I think if I'm, I, I do, because I I used to, I was there when it kind of sort of started. I, even I knew then I wasn't a massive supporter of it, and I knew how bad it was then. But it's, I think it is no, it's definitely I think one of the massive things. I think it is partly reason why. I mean, I would also mention to parents who are concerned about this, there is a way definitely on Sony's that you can put a limit of how much they spend a week for about, I think it's about like, you can put a certain amount, like you can put like a 10 pound limit, a 20 pound limit, and then anything after it can either block or you give them the okay for it. So it, there is a simple, but that's a, a, a beside the point. It shouldn't be a thing. I mean, and it's more for other things. So you know, that your parents don't suddenly, like your kid spies a load of games without knowing that it's using your parents' credit card. I mean, with this, it's, there is no systems on the actual game that it's more on the consoles and even if you let's say do it on pc there are none which is the more scariest thing yeah but the, the the thing is as well sorry um with this whole gambling thing and everything else up with the fifth ultimate team and fifth ultimate team is probably the biggest one that's going at the minute you look at people that are on youtube and on twitch right they're getting paid to sit there play this game and you know, just get thousands and thousands of people to watch them. They sit there, they put their money into it. So you see by their favor points, as an example. And then all these packs come up, like these special promo packs come up for the weekend. And they're getting all these players. And this kid's sitting there thinking, oh, if I had that amount of FIFA points, I could get this player. Yeah. That's but it, it, it doesn't work like that because the percentage of certain people get that player because of who they are. Not through pack luck, it's because of who they are. The, the streamers get pretty much what they want. No, there are saying that the French, uh, I think it was the French government a couple of years ago, ha uh, have actually asked the e uh, EA to actually give them their code to that because of that reason, because they are slightly suspicious that it might it's sort of fixed. And if that, I think if they are found that, that they could get into serious trouble. Because yeah, I think that's I, why I, they've called for it. So I, I'm, I yeah. uh, probably agree that it's probably something to do with that. 
I, I believe it's fixed. There's further yeah. ways around it, though, isn't there? I mean, if you look at like the, yeah, what's his name? Um, Matt HD Gamer is like one of the biggest FIFA. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you look at someone like him, okay, so the, the fact that one, they do a road to glory one where they show what a team would look like without FIFA points. The fact that it's got to that point where they need to show two different teams just because they got one that's so focused on FIFA points. And then the reality is, you know, he'll show us when he opens five packs. If he's going to open 10 packs and get no pulls from it, he's not going to make a video and post that online because it's not going to get anyone watching it. People want to watch because they want to see the big pulls. So he could spend... Yeah. A thousand pounds on packs, he'll show you him using 50 quid's worth of points and show you the one where he pulled out the worldy player. You don't see the other 950 pounds that was no. spent that pulled in absolute rubbish. So I think Regan's right to a point that they do get what they want. I think the percentages are the same as what me and you get, but they're probably encouraged. They know that if they spend a thousand pounds on FIFA points from promos of doing the videos alone, they're making more money than that back. So they can, it's, it's an investment for them to do that compared to me or you who's going to spend 500 quid and still end up with a crap team that can't can't win 15 games in a weekend league. Yeah, oh, no, 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 I, I, I get think that. The it's... worst one is probably Road to Shore, surely. Road yeah, to I know I was going to mention like, him. The amount of times he gets good players is like ridiculous. So and he and he goes like smashing controls and all that. So I would say if I think that is a thing. I think especially in the UK, I think it's really bad. I mean, I know also what makes it worse is I think a lot of them are with like franchises. Because I know yeah, but... MGH or Matt Game HD Gamer, which is now known as MGH, is now part of Veloce, and I know I like some of the other ones obviously part of, like Sidemen or other things, and I think that also helps. So they'll probably go through other sides, but I know that's probably something also that's probably bringing to that. Yeah, but I, I sat there and used to watch um, a lot of Castro. I mean, the guy who lives in America or, well, some part of it. And literally, dead. his team was absolutely ridiculous. Probably. And he would just sit there and he had like packs upon packs upon packs that wasn't opened. And then he had loads of FIFA points sitting there in the corner. And he went, literally, I think he spent half an hour sitting there opening packs. But when I was watching it, he had a grand total of 10 legends that popped out. 10 high decent inform with the weeks. Mm. He had all of this other stuff and every single player he packed was basically rated 85 plus. That's hard to do. I mean, if I know what the percentage is about less than 10%, that's impossible. That's right. so impossible. And now you see why I think it's fixed. Like you, the fact that he's sitting there putting out legends like it's nothing, putting out the informs like it's nothing, Getting 85 rated players like it's nothing. And it's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. You get 70s, you get 60s, you get one half decent inform if you're lucky. And then you've got to sit there and you've got to grind your way through to get all these players to get packs again, to then get nothing, to then grind. But yeah, think, some, some people think, just get it. It's just like, come on. I think the reality is, though, and you know, this is what all comes back to, you know, looking at paid partnerships, looking at, you know, all, everything else we've just discussed around it. Let's face it, they, they're doing the bare minimum they can to keep getting away with doing it because we've already said about how much money they make off of it. So there's there's no way they're going to look at this and go, do you know what we're doing? A lot of, we're doing a lot more harm than good. We're getting people sitting there grinding 30, 30 games over a weekend alone. I know they're reducing that for FIFA 22, but we're encouraging people to spend I know we, we talk, we're all gamers, we all love spending time, but they're talking about encouraging you to spend your whole weekend playing FIFA to get some rewards and then encourage you to go and buy points and buy packs. Everything they're doing is about trying to make as much money out of the players of the game as they possibly can. And, and I think that's where the issue is when it comes back to gambling is that as an adult, if I choose to do that, you know, and I decide to spend my 30 hours that weekend and I spend my money fine but you need to put the support measures in place so the same as other gambling companies do and if you're younger than right. that then you're not you're not supporting them you're encouraging the wrong sets of behavior you're stopping kids from doing their proper development you're creating bad gambling habits and it's yeah it's, it's, a, it's a really big issue and I, I can't say anything i've bought fifa points you know i play ultimate team every year but at the same time it's so easy to see that the system's been manipulated and yet no one's doing anything about it no, I agree, agree, agree. But I just um, want to quickly, the sorry, let me just quickly before we end, I just want to chuck a figure in. So last year, EA 
made 1.62 billion alone from the Ultimate Team Jeez. series. And I think that's the problem there. And that is also the reason why it's never going to change. I dare to think what 2K is like, because that's even worse, because you have yep. to pay everything with VC. Yeah. There, from tattoos, hairstyles, to clothing, everything. And that's including, like, buying car packs. I mean, I dare to think what 2K is like, because especially even, I think, like, the most expensive pack on 2K is about £99. It's yeah. I know ridiculous it's ridiculously money. expensive. But no, yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good way of ending that one. But no, on to uh, my final bit of gaming news is we had the little uh, PlayStation 5 showcase or more PlayStation showcase. I don't know if anyone watched it here. Did anyone? Um, I caught glimpses of it. I've seen like bits released on Twitter and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I mean, we had some massive announcements. I mean... We had the announcement of Gran Turismo 7 now happening in March. Looking forward to that. And it's also now confirmed to PlayStation 4, which has brought some alarm bells, as well as they've now just announced that all safe files now have to be done via online. So it means it's online only. Same with sports, which I know a lot of people are not too happy about. But I'm okay. I, I'm a big fan of that series. I can't wait for that game to come out. We also had the God of War Ragnarok uh, gameplay shown off and shown off Thor, which looks, I mean, I wasn't expecting Thor to look like that. I didn't even know Thor was going to be in the game. So basically, if you think of him, of Thor going to be like some Marvel character, he's complete opposite. He's more like the Marvel at the beginning where he's all kind of eating too much type of uh, Thor. So that, I mean, I was looking forward to seeing that as well as we've had um, the um, uh, Star Wars Old Republic. If anyone remember playing that, that's going to get a remake on PS5. Yeah. I really hope that's going to be as good. So I must I've played the sequel and I quite enjoyed that. And then the two big ones. I would actually say probably the two biggest announcements of that night, apart from God of War, Ragnarok. So I, I must must I'm I've played Ragnarok. Oh no, so I played the the reboot God of War. I like the music. I just didn't get into the game as much. Although I must be honest, the voice acting is brilliant and the whole story is just belt. I just can't get into it as much. Was Insomniac's two games announcements. One being Spider Man Two which looks like it's going to have Venom in it and could be even dual play because it's going to have Miles Morales in there as well. I'm really, 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 really looking forward to that. I'm a big fan of the original game. I haven't played... The, oh, I don't own Miles Morales. I have played it. Love that game. I'm really looking forward to that uh, whole game uh, being really... I think I could absolutely be a good sequel. I just hope it has online play. And the final one, which came out of absolutely nowhere, we're getting a Wolverine game. I mean, how does people feel about them? These like the amount of announcements we got through the PS5. I mean, I know there's like other ones like Elden Ring. I think that was also mentioned in there as well. I think, as you said, Wolverine come out of like absolutely nowhere. So that's going to be a very interesting one. Um, God of War. They have said it's going to be mature. To. They have said it's going to be like an 18. I think really? they're going to say and it's I think mature it adult stuff. I think it needs oh, to God, be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, God of War. I'm really looking forward to. Um, I think their problem and Spider Man, of course. Like the fir- I've not oh. played Miles Morales yet, but the first Spider Man. I don't was think brilliant. you need to play it. It's probably worth playing for what it is. Yeah, but it is quite a short game. But I would say it's just worth playing anyway because it's really nice and the story just carried on. You can see what it's going through. But no, I don't think it's like mandatory. No, oh, fair enough. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next Spider Man. God, there's some big games coming out, so. Oh, God. Let's just hope and pray for no, well, obviously no cancellations, but with Sony, um, they're not too common to do it. Yeah. Xbox, more common. Sony don't really do that. They delay them, they don't really cancel them. I mean, there was the scare with Last Guardian, but I think that was just because we hadn't earned anything. So uh, let's just, just hope for no delays as well. Let's yeah. just get these games. Let's enjoy the games and let's. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So, that is gaming news. I think the last little bit before we answer people's questions, I kind of want to touch on as well, was the whole potential sale of WWE to Disney. Now, I've seen the rumours fly about. Um, It's not, I would say, if you try and hunt for it, it's not on the most sourceful of pages yeah. but um i think the only one you could say okay they are kind of reliable is cultaholic this is it 
But I would say and, the Russell Talk I haven't mentioned it, and that's why I normally look at. And I've now joined Cultaholic just to keep an eye on this because they do talk stories. And I will say they are the only one I have seen mentioned. Yeah, and since it has been mentioned the first time, all talks have kind of disappeared since. So it's like, mm. right, okay, was that just something they've picked up in the wind and gone, oh, look, this could happen? Or is there more behind it? And I don't think we're going to know until, you know, closer yeah, to the time. time because they're saying it's uh, lined up for the next two years. It's something they're not looking to actually execute until two years' time. But it's certainly going to be interesting if WWE, if that is what they're looking to do, they are looking to line up a potential sale to Disney. But yeah, I think that's something that over the next months and it, well, even over the next year, that we're going to certainly be keeping a close eye on. I mean, you can sort of tell at the moment what they're doing with the amount of like released people they've done and what's going on. I mean, with the whole revamp of NXT UK. I mean, it, I mean, there's obviously I know, and I know he probably wants to. I have heard those names quite around, so I think he knows it's probably he could probably sell it for a really good price as well. But I know I think there was rumours of ESPN. I know Fox was also mentioned and all sorts. But I mean, I, Disney, I don't know what they would do because the problem is, would they try and make it kidified? Will they dumb a lot of it down? Will they put it on stars? I mean, I, I personally would if you are going to buy it, put it on stars, which is the Disney Plus adult sector they have. And also, like, how will they like merge SmackDown and Raw together again? Will they keep them separate? Will they do all of their stuff at Disney Land? Will they have other locations? I mean, because obviously there are other Disney's. I think there's like there's one in Japan. I think there's Korea. Obviously France. I think there's a couple of other ones out there. I mean, will they try and move them all over around there? Will they try and put other locations out there? It, I would say it's... A, I could see it, because I know literally, as someone says, like, a couple of... Uh, there's a really good joke. I think a uh, joke I saw someone do on a sket, uh, a show I watch on YouTube, on which was Cadicorous. He talked about, basically, Disney all started with, basically, like, a little movie thing, and now they're literally buying the entire world kind of thing, and I could see them absolutely doing it. It's just, do I see them actually doing it? I don't know. Well, this is the thing, and you brought up a really good point, actually. If the sale goes through, what happens to WWE? Like, do they merge everything together? Do they... Uh, the possibilities are endless. Like, what happens to the way WWE... The way WWE is run now, do they try and expand into other things? Will they open the Forbidden Door? It's well, they kind yeah. of can do because they've got, I think, stuff with China, don't they? Because I think, oh no, not China, they're in Japan. Because I think they have got, isn't there Disney in Japan? I think. Yeah, you've got. I uh, might be wrong, Korea, but yeah, I, honest, I think they would. I think they're likely to do much things much the same don't right i think they'll they'll do their own things i think you're right they probably would add it to their um you know let's face it this is probably mainly in addition since they started doing the disney plus yeah um definitely yeah. try to build out and become a competitor more to the likes of amazon prime and netflix um but yeah i, I don't i feel like they'll keep targeting the same audience it's got a proven if you look at it more like a sales thing you know it's got a proven track record with young kids but also adults alike so I can't see them massively trying to change their target market. Um, I think I think it's just a massive play for their for their Disney Plus, and just you're right to keep building into that Disney brand to start building out. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if they started. You know, this is maybe the first of many acquisitions of, of sort of events and, and series like that. I mean, not only that, what is also good because I know obviously they have done it in the past. Like I know Sasha Banks has stuff done with Disney with the uh, man. Is it Mandalorian? Mandal Man the Mandalorian. Mandalorian. That's it, Mandalorian. Yeah. So I would say also it means that they could probably do like contracts saying, okay, you can also wrestle, and as well, we might use you in movies or TV series as well. I can imagine that as well being a thing. I just hope they don't make the same mistakes that if it does happen, that Vince does, and all of his team do like changing things as quickly, making some of the most weirdest scripts of all, don't do certain wrestling match, cut things very, sorry, fire people for no reason, or firing your people who are your best loved people, i.e. the Fiend, or, and then also still using the Fiend, even though it's, he's gone, 
and stuff. I just hope if it does happen that they just learn and listen to the fans and not just go, yeah, we do that and you're gonna take and you're gonna be okay with it. End of story kind of thing. Well, this guess... is the thing. No, go on, go on, go on, because I wanna oh. actually go back to a point that you made, but yeah, finish. Oh, <laughs> I was just going to say, it's quite, you raised quite an interesting point there because think of how many, you, you mentioned Disney, where they'll let them go into other shows, series, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because how many, you know, celebrities now do we see um, making that crossover? And traditionally, it's always been one or the other. You, you're in wrestling, you have to take that step away. Um, you know, you still have to end up paying some of your fees and the rights you make back to, back to them for them initially finding you. Um, and they, they maybe find that crossover harder. I guess if they were to join Disney, you're right, all of the, you know, all of the wrestlers who wanted, you know, take a step outside the wrestling world, there's a massive avenue for their own sort of like individual direct content that they're creating to, to take that first step into. So it'd be quite interesting to see how that progresses in terms of other content they're making and the crossover with, you know, the guys they've got on, on, on the WWE. Yeah, that's it. And like you said before about the whole sales pitch, I think, look at what WWE have done, obviously, in the States. So they've strayed away from the network. Now, is this going to be WWE's way of getting rid of the network, but still being able to provide wrestling on demand worldwide? Because obviously, at the minute, they're using Peacock in the States, which we don't have. I think any, I'm pretty no, they sure are bringing only... it over and it's useless, I've been told. It's yeah, quite poor they're... research engine doesn't work. So is this going to be a way to get WWE onto Disney Plus and then just stray away from the network altogether? It definitely. I mean, obviously, look at, if you even look at stuff like football, how many football matches now are going to be streamed on live streaming services like Amazon, Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, you know, instead of being on traditional new sports channels. And they're, they're really, is it Sky Italia? I think lost the rights to the Serie A football yeah. matches, live streaming services. And you think what a massive impact that is. You're right. If, if someone likes WWE, they like wrestling, they're going to pay for a Disney Plus subscription to watch it. You know, on the big pay-per-views that they tried to get people to sign up for, how much easier is it going to be when it's just clicking one button and then you Disney Plus account to sign up to one of those large pay-per-views compared to, you know, previously you have to you go onto your channel, you have to sign up, give your card details. It's convenience and it's ease. And I, I think, weirdly, it sounds like leaving the, the channels and going to a streaming service is risky, but they could end up making a lot more money and possibly get a lot more pay-per-views off the back of it. And yeah, I've just had a true. thought, and I've just had a thought, which would, I think, gives more reason for Disney, as to the more than Peacock, is Disney has that thing with you can pay for like like the cinema movies on the yes. plus, so that I bet they'll use that for the pay per views. Oh, they're, yeah, they're just going to put another paywall behind it, aren't they? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm just. I've just had that alarm bell going. Ah, oh, that. I mean, That's, why they might yeah. do that? They're going to start. I mean, the, what they might do is like they say, if you want to watch it live, pay like what is it like sixteen quid to watch it like something like movie. that. Yeah, I think it's about sixteen quid, and then like maybe like a month later they go, okay, you can now watch like money in the bank or evolve evolution or whatever uh free like after a month or so and you don't have to pay for it that's yeah the only maybe thing, they'll I would say the, the only thing that's alarm bell is the whole pay-per-view thing i didn't even think of that now that's, now this rumor yeah. now this rumor sounding quite exciting and everyone's hoping that disney yeah i didn't <laughs> think of that <laughs> oh dear oh, you know the interesting God. thing is gonna be the figure is how much is this deal going to cost if yeah. this is the direction that it's going? It's so hard, that. isn't it? Because, I mean, in theory, it's such a recognisable brand in what it, and it's there's such a huge fan base globally. You just think, why would someone sell it unless Disney were coming in with a massive offer? I, I, can't, I can't see it being... I can't see... I can, I can I'd honestly... My mind boggles at what the figure could be. Do you know um, what? I have a hunch. I might know the number. Go on, I'm just out looking at play this back in in two years. Time yeah, we'll right. see how no, I could I, I could see this because like what happened last year? We had the big announcement of Microsoft buying Cinemax, right? Which is yeah. only the second most expensive like buyout of any game company, which was seven point five billion, right? 
I can imagine that probably getting around that or near that number. Wow. See, I think it's going to be much more than that. Really? Yeah. Oh, I think I can imagine that. I think it, I think the most expensive was about twelve billion, and that was for a company in Sweden, the mobile company in Sweden, but which was bought by um, Tencent. So yes, I, I can one hundred percent agree that. I, I think it was about that. twelve billion uh, about that time. So I can say it'll be around twelve, like twelve, maybe even twenty. No, I, I reckon mean, it's going to be, be gonna one of the biggest acquisitions in history. How much, yeah. like, how much did they pay for Star Wars? Uh, oh, yeah, that's because that's obviously. You know, I mean, I don't mean I don't know how you compare the two, but I mean, I, I would imagine it'd be a similar figure. If I was, you know, the guys in the WWE, uh, I'd, tell them, I'd say, "What have you paid for Star Wars, and can I get that amount?" Uh, Star Wars, Disney acquired Pixar. Wow. Okay, so the Pixar acquisition was seven point four billion dollars. Um, Marvel acquisition was four billion. Where's Star Wars? Four billion. Yeah, four point zero five billion dollars. That's actually quite small. Yeah, I thought it'd be more than that. I mean, I could, I know, one hundred percent. They will go for bigger money. They will go for bigger money. Yeah, certainly going to be interesting to see when it all comes out. Just how much it's going to be. Quite. So yeah, now I think all we've got left to do is to answer some questions that have yes, been generously have. sent in. By son of Odin, few. yet again. Yeah, son of Odin. Or have you got some yeah. on Twitter as well? No, we've got son of Odin. We've got Shields Pup sent some in as well. That's good. And yeah, we've got some nice questions to get yeah. through. Yeah. I'm trying to go from the top, trying to see what the most recent one is. I think some is. of these we have done. Some of we have done. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I believe the most recent one that we haven't done, start with that, is uh, if you could... Would you become a game tester and get paid for that, knowing after a while the love for streaming games and playing games just won't be the same after a set amount of time? Well, I actually have a very interesting um, perspective on this because I did three years at college doing games development, so okay. I can actually put a so I can actually put a lot of info. But it is the hardest thing to do is game testing, actually, believe it or not. Yeah, because the problem is because you, I mean, there are so many people that have done it, and I must admit, there are people that go, "Oh yeah, I want to be a game tester because I enjoy like playing games and all that." And that's what you think it is. Uh, uh-uh. it's nothing like that because you have to like they'll basically give you a game to test, and they'll set you like some things like, "Hey, could you go into this wall? Could you shoot this person?" Yeah. And then you're like, if there are any bugs, you then have to report back to it and explain what you did and how they should fix it, and like in real good detail because I have a whole book on it. Which I will say to anyone who is interested, books are very hard to find anything on this. So, I mean, the book I have is probably one of the best and it does have a CD as well. But it is a hard thing to do. Would I do it? Absolutely not. I mean, I've done beta te- like beta testing, like where you do like closed and open beta testing, like yeah. all sorts of games. I mean, like given a gun by one of my best examples, I did the really, really, really early days of Gran Turismo Sport. Okay. Like the, I mean, really early days when they did, where they had the old handling model on mm. it and which they've now completely changed i mean that i mean it was like a different game then to what it is now yeah i bet so i mean i don't know yeah definitely the handling model and i mean obviously i think lotus then mysteriously left the game at the same time we don't know why they mysteriously left at the same time too so um i mean i i would personally say i wouldn't do it but i mean if you are interested have a look at it get a book out i would say you just need to be aware it's not what you think it is it is no, very I can imagine from, I mean, if you're going to do twitching, it's not game testing. You might get like, I know because I know you've got um, done some partnerships with other companies, yeah. Yourself, um, with and that I would say is like showing off games and doing all that. That I would, I would never say it's that's not game testing, that's just showing no, off not at all, or pre release, yeah. So, I got obviously, I did the partnership very recently with Square Enix, and I got a copy of Life is Strange. Uh, two days before release and obviously i wasn't allowed to stream it until the game come out which was fair i knew that but yeah that's no part of that that was game testing in the slightest it was just me getting to try the game and getting to give or not even that it was me getting to try the game and kind of write my thoughts down before i got to stream it so i had a bit of a hands-on feel for the game before i actually got to stream the game to other people or even make a video about it 
It wasn't yeah, just me like diving in the deep end. Yeah, kind of exactly. Just going, I have no idea what I'm doing. And... Yeah, but yeah, I kind of got yeah. to play the game before it officially come out. And then on release, I got to stream it. So I knew when I got that partnership that I wasn't allowed to stream it until it come out. But they was like, get a hand on the game. Um, yeah, and just like gather your thoughts on the game before you're allowed to actually release anything, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, then all, yeah. obviously they said, all we want from you is to say that we're sponsoring the video, which, yeah, absolutely fine. But yeah, no part of that. I think that's that more for a legal perspective testing. because in the UK you have to because of yeah, the that's... Oreo incident a couple of years ago. So yeah, yeah it's kind of a legal yeah. thing. But I mean, in, in reality, it's, it sounds like it'd be a really good job, but it's probably every gamer's worst nightmare because there's oh, nothing God, yeah. worse than playing a game that isn't complete, that's glitchy, and oh, you can't actually get through it. So I, I, I think the short answer would be absolutely not. I think you, you touched a point there that the betas and stuff, and that, you know, I'm, I play the FIFA 22 beta at the moment, then those are good because you get what is close to the polished game, and you, like you said, you get a bit of a head start, so if you're mm. streaming or if you're playing, you know a bit more before. But yeah, I, I think full-blown games testing, I think you just take all the enjoyment out of playing whatever the finished game and article is. Um, yeah, because so I have it, heard like yeah. people like play it so long, they're like, "Oh, I don't want to play this anymore." You lose kind of the thing. love for it. That's the. Well, thing. not only I mean, I yeah, no, quite no. As well as that, I also because I have to be because I did a test for um, a company on Mean Greens. They want I think I wanted to test. I think it was the Xbox version okay. of servers and stuff, and like you know, like controls wise. I mean, I, my word was it needing fixing and stuff like some of the sensitive controls were shocking, and the and amount of time it took to actually find anyone and the AI. Was only in two types of games. It was. I mean, the guy still have it. I love the game. Yeah. But um, I mean, it did. No, I mean, definitely needed testing. And I think we did have a time of me playing that. I was. I mean, I know what it's like. It is definitely. It's a lot harder than you think it is. But I'm. I would say to anyone who is thinking about, it, just you need to know what you're in before you do it. Yeah. So I actually know someone who's a very good friend of mine. I won't name drop him because of you know legal issues and that. And uh, he's yeah, he's actually a game tester for uh, Mediatonic, and his Who's massive Mediatonic, project, uh, Fall Guys. A oh okay, yeah. Massive project is he's been working on Fall Guys, doing all the tests, and I know for a fact he loves his job. Like we talk all the time, um, he loves his job, and it's kind of a relief for me to see that that he's not. I don't think he's ever played the game officially. And I know when I stream Fall Guys, it's a bit like, oh, I'm sick of seeing this game. But I know for a fact, like, all he talks about is work. And I love the passion that he has for his job. But yeah, on the other side of the things, it's a bit like, oh, he doesn't like seeing anything about the game. But then I suppose I'm the same with my job. You know, when I'm not at work, I don't want to see that when I'm at home. My home time and yeah. my work time is two different, like, two different uh, lives. So I kind of get that aspect of it, but he's good at his job. I know that for a fact. He's quite high up and he loves it. So I'm glad to see he's not lost the passion for gaming. But on the other side of the scale, it's a bit like, oh, well, when I'm playing that game, he don't want to hear any mention of it. Yeah, I think half of what I enjoy about gaming, though, as well, half of it's enjoying the game. The other half is enjoying a game with other people. You know, FIFA, Pro Clubs, Call of Duty, you know, you name or any of these games. Like, you know, there's some part, part and parcel of the fun of having a game is yeah. playing with other people online and, and talking to your mates about it. You know, I've got countless WhatsApp groups all, all around gaming. So I think as much as I'd enjoy having the day-to-day -day job just playing the game and enjoying it, and if you enjoy it, happy days. But the, you're almost losing that social element because, like you said, the last thing you're going to want to do then is finish work practicing games and testing them out and then going online and playing another game that you've tested previously with other people yeah that's it and like you said it's yep. that social aspect that as you say you've moved away you've not seen regan in so long but you still have that social aspect of playing with regan on different games and yeah definitely yeah, and you lose that. Not, yeah not even just to be honest, not just regan. i mean the esports team i've met I've probably only met two of the lads in the whole esports team, but I probably talk to these guys on a, a daily basis. I'm yeah. starting to learn all about their lives and stuff like that. There's some of them are in Manchester where I lived, you know, some are in Essex. You're going to meet up with beers with some of them. So it's 
yeah, it's, it's quite a good, you know, it's a very modern way now of, um, of sort of like connecting with people and, uh, and sort of meeting people. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's a it's a mainstay. And I don't know if I'd get that if I was doing that as a day job all the time. So, yeah, I'd probably say no to that question. Yeah, spot on. Uh, where are we at? Oh, and then you and Regan were having a little debate question. on it. Uh-huh. Uh, if you were to be a part of a game, whether it's helping develop it or design stuff in game, what type of game series would you like to be a part of? Uh, for me, I think, again, because I accidentally answered most of these on the Discord by accident. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I've said one thing and one thing I own, and I'm ironic, and I'm actually sort of looking into it at the moment, is being more involved. And um, There's a company in the UK uh, that was originally in the US that is growing at like sublime pace I have ever seen in any company and they're known as the motorsport games uh, I, and I, I want to work with them so much because they have got so much stuff I like because they're basically a racing company and hence the name motorsport games but they're nabbing every single big license at the moment because they've got the NASCAR game coming out in the next uh, at the end of this year They've got the British Touring Cars game coming out next year, which is the first game we've uh, we've had a British Touring Car game in 20 years. They've nabbed the IndyCar license, which I think they're planning to make one in 2023. And they've also got the Le Mans license, which they're starting doing like some little bit of series uh, this year with some temperature. And they're going to make a full game, I believe, in 2022, 2023. And, dead, and they've also nabbed, uh, now opening a place in Australia where they've got a car craft with them which means they might even do a Super V8 game as well. I mean, if I was going to work with them, it would be either probably their eSports side or game research side, uh, morely, because I I mean, as I, I mean, all I do is research stuff, and I would always come up with the ideas for me, and also I love watching eSports, so I'll try and com- commentate for them and stuff. I mean, that's the way I was going for my, me personally. Laura, right. you've put a lot more thought into your answer than mine. <laughs> Oh, oh, believe exactly me, exactly I've, I know this answer <laughs> quite a lot, so I've always been enjoying that, because it's, as I say, I research for fun. So, yeah. I think for me, I think it's more, less so because I can think of a job I'd be particularly good at. I mean, I'm I'm a salesperson, so I think whatever job I would go into, it would probably be on the sales pitching side either way. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the game series I would like to get involved with, just because I think it's brilliant, but I also think they've just missed a trick, and that would be the Elder Scrolls series, um, just because, for, basically. For, yeah, for, for the role-playing games, they're amazing, but the, they've just never got online play quite right for it. Um, no, so for, I know what you mean, because I've got ESO, and it's just hard. I don't know it's if it's just too, same, it's too grindy. It's way too grindy, in my opinion. Yeah, so for me, I think that's, that's probably the gaming series. One, just because they take years to make. They're so in-depth, that, and they, yeah. I, I, I love the games themselves. I, I just could go back and forth between Skyrim and Oblivion just probably endlessly um but yeah I, I, I tried playing Elder Scrolls Online I just it just didn't give the same buzz the same satisfaction the same sort of progression so I feel like that's something where they could improve and maybe where I don't think I'd be a game changer but I think there's that's where I could try to provide some input as someone that loves the games no are you going to get the new one? Oh yeah yeah, I was going to say, because they've about, if anyone hasn't heard, they've just announced again, they're releasing again Skyrim for the fourth time or something? Yeah, they, they've got like the so many bolts on in add ons and Dawn Guard and oh, <laughs> drag up so many bolt on add ons. But yeah, I, I will, I've literally just finished playing the last game and then they literally announced announced it again. So. Because they basically, I think anyone who is thinking about getting, I will say, if you've got it on PC and you've got the last version for free, you'll get this version for free as well just as a heads up oh, that's pretty cool yeah as long as you bought the last version which was the elder scrolls i don't know legacy edition i don't know what they called the last one <laughs> and there's so many names I'm yeah lost track. <laughs> yeah it, it's stupid yeah, that, that what about be, you that'd be my choice yeah. uh see i'd have to and i think i still should go and get a job at 2k and help develop oh, the next wwe game <laughs> Because if they re-release anything like not only 2K20, but also Battlegrounds, then yeah, yeah, there's going to be some serious stuff that goes down. I think they already are in trouble, if I'm honest. I think, to be honest, by the time you will probably get the job, they've already lost it. 
Well, this is the other thing. So much hot water at the moment. They're in so much hot water, and I know what you mean. I mean, if it was me, I would look at the companies. Maybe I was the Aki. Or, yeah. Um, I mean, even M. Di- I mean, would would you work with him? Actually, no, I know he wouldn't work with anyone, but M. Dicky, because I know he. I mean, these games are brilliant. Yeah, I shout out to him. The, that and it's all by himself. That's the amazing. Oh. Thing. But even, I mean, he does everything we want in a game. I mean, oh, there's yeah. even death in it. Death. Who who puts on a wrestling game? He does. It's brilliant. The best thing is like you look at, like you said, you can look at Aki, and even the new AEW game. When the screenshots and the little bit of video footage I've seen of it, it just screamed, here comes the pain. And yeah. they're going back to an old engine to make what they, obviously, they want to be a good game. WWE are trying to, I don't know what they're trying to do with their games. What 2K <laughs> I'll be honest, I think no one knows games. now. But Just basically shoot themselves in the foot, fire everyone that was actually good at it, and then go, yeah, well, we should be fine now, and then have a... You know, you know that meme that's around where there's like the guy sitting drinking tea and there's a fire going yeah. around. I think that's what's going on at the moment. Going, Basically, oh, fine. Like you're burning in a building. You're, it's not okay. But what one of the developers said as well is that the roster is so outdated already because Agreed. everyone keeps getting released. By the time I think was it something like that? Yeah, fifty six guys. But you can just tell by the screenshots that they've actually released of the game, that it's outdated already. But also, it's like, well, who's even going to be in this game? Because they're just letting everyone go. And NXT is outdated now, because they've not probably got the old NXT, so yep. they'll probably have to redo the NXT to put call it NXT 2.0 as well. So. And are they going to do that in time to hit a release date that they want? Because we're no, getting closer you know and closer what to like it. There's no way. There's no way they'll be able to do it. That's what I mean. So it's a bit like, well... Yeah. How? But yeah, I think I'd love to get a job at 2K and just, not even if I could offer them anything, I'd like to see what is actually going on. Yeah. It just be nosy more than anything. No, quite. But it's not 2K that actually make it, it's another company, uh, because 2K is the publisher, which is also Ben Take-Two, but I know I know who you basically mean. Yeah, I can't think who thing. it is. Yeah. Uh, They're new oh, companies that were specifically built. They were specifically built to build that. That worries me. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that was the alarm bell. With regards to the sport you watch, racing, visual tennis, concepts. That's that it. it. Visual concepts. With regards to the sport you watch, racing, tennis, pro wrestling, football, boxing, etc. Who got you into the sport, and what person kept you interested in the sport, uh, like the pros? Uh, I think mainly my answer to that it, with the motorsport, um, that was mainly my dad. That was literally my dad. Like there are footage of like video footage when I was like I don't know, a couple of months old in a buggy, not buggy, um, like a car chair. You know who you put into your car? Yeah. Of me just watching it and it, like watching something, and then you hear in the background sounds of Formula One because this would have been '97 of like Damon Hill and all that with Murray Walker speaking over it and me just eyeing it looking completely <laughs> interested because I used to rock all the flipping time no matter what yeah. and that was like one of the few things that actually calm, like just kept me going oh I like this kind of thing although admittingly I'm more of a British touring car guy and a, G- a GT guy and Le Mans guy although my dad's a massive Le Mans guy himself because he's been there three times I think he said he's been there three times or twice Jeez. to Le Mans in the in the, uh, the old days in the night uh, in the 80s I think that being like the four GT days yeah um um, around that, but other bits. I mean, like the tennis. That's a, that's a family thing because I think my parents used my mom and uh, her, her family used to do it quite a bit as well as the table tennis. Um, like again, it's like my music taste. My music taste is a bit of everyone. In fact, there's a favorite. There's a really good story that well, I, we were doing. I was at a um, ca- uh, kind of charity thing where like some of my dad's mates were doing, and uh, and my mum's, and they were doing all these like songs. That I, I think most of my lot would have never heard of or had an inkling of but me i knew a lot of them and i was like singing off and uh one of the people went up to me going how do you know these and i just pointed to my dad and he just had the biggest clarkson smug grin you could see just saying i've taught you well i've taught him well kind of thing <laughs> but with wrestling that was purely i think it was the rock mainly that got me like to watch it because i think i knew of him and, and of everyone around having like the boxes with like undertaker and cena it was more like me that did it 
Yeah. But if I'm honest, then it was only one person. I mean, obviously the other stuff I've watched now is because of like, like Kurt Angle, like Mandrews, which is Mark Andrews from NXT, but that's when he was an impact, like all these other stuff around. But the one thing that got me into wrestling to actually watch it, it sounds really weird, but I I will get explained. I think I have explained this before is page mm. or Sarah Knight, as I think or Sarah Knight is a Twitch name is because uh, I, th- I, I think I, c- I came up with her by accident. I think it was mentioned on news or something because of her age when she won it. She was like 25 or something. I can't remember when she won it the first time. No, I don't oh, no, think she was that 19, old. Or was it 19? No, 19, 18, 19, yeah. I think she was or something. And I was like, oh, okay. Because I think they'll mention it because one, she was British and she was the youngest and still is the youngest ever person to win this Divas title. And I just remember looking uh, look at Paige, I was going, she's not like typical divas women's champion because i had like a wwe 2011 game i think i may have even had 2k14 at the time maybe wrong i might have had it before after that and i always remember them all looking like very similar model type yeah uh, disrespect to all of them and that but uh, it was just like all look very samey bar gal kim who was uh, probably the only one that i actually quite enjoyed watching at the time and still love watching when she was an impact and they're all like very, very like beautiful, pretty looking thing. Where Paige wasn't, she was very much of the goth emo type of thing. And uh, I mean, if you've watched the movie, I wish I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic movie. It does show that it because of I think it's probably just the whole story of the family. I just enjoyed, it, and that's part of the reason why I started watching it. And then I've just watched it like with Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose watching it, and that's how I watched it. But then again, I didn't watch the first time with. WWE, I watched it with Impact, but it's just, I think it's the people, I wa- the, the wrestlers I watched it for, and the music, and then I just got hooked. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. My answer, and probably not as detailed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think for me, if I was going to choose two sports, it'd probably be um, football and poker, are probably my two uh, passions. Um, family, if it was family who got me into it, that would probably be uh, my dad, massive Chelsea fan, well into playing poker since I was about 10. Um, and talking about people who actually got me interested in both games and sports and what kept me, you know, coming back after all these years. Um, I was a Chelsea fan since I was since I was born. So probably Roberto Di Matteo um, was uh, oh, yeah, yeah. a player as a, as a young a young man. A, good, a little antidote the story my dad took me on a tour of Stamford Bridge and I was quite young and we met Gianluca Viali who was the player manager at the time for Chelsea and um, I didn't realize who he was and uh, he asked me if I wanted his autograph and I told him no I want Di Matteo's uh, <laughs> and my dad still hasn't forgiven me to this day uh, so yeah that I'd probably say it's my dad and yeah and initially Di Matteo then Zola then Lampard and Drogba who kept interested in football and in particular you know, I have an interesting um, interesting fact about Frank Lampard oh, go I, on. I don't know if it, okay I, I, I presume everyone knows Frank Lampard is a public school boy right yeah 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 because he, he went to Brentwood school yeah I only live 10 minutes down from that school I've got a different so, yeah. fact actually about football. Wait, I, was gonna lie. I thought the fact was going to be a lot more interesting than that. <laughs> it's interesting, it's interesting, but obviously, it's like, I lived near that school. I didn't live the school he used to go to. That's what it's my thing. But... Yeah. No, it's, it, yeah, he's, he's one of the things. He's one of my, my favorite all time players. And oh, then yeah. um, poker wise, probably uh, when I was younger, I used to like watching, it used to come on at about two in the morning world series of poker tournaments used to come on on the telly and i used to watch uh daniel Mangano, who's like a canadian poker player who uh just used to give people stick while he's playing the game and he got me into poker and playing online poker and tournaments so yeah those are probably my two sports related if you can call poker a sport uh passions yeah. and they're probably the the individuals who who kept me enticed mm. nice uh, i'm trying to think now because thing is Every sport that I like and that, I'm, I can't really put a person to who actually got me into it. So, like, I'm quite into my tennis, but not as much as I used to be. But I like tennis. I like watching it. Uh, but, again, I think that, I think, come from college because I never really paid any attention to tennis until yeah. I was doing um, sports physio and psychology. 
at college and I was like, oh, like tennis is cool. And then, yeah, I kind of got into it like that. Wrestling, uh, I blame my mum for because she woke me up one morning to watch WrestleMania and then it just stemmed from that. You caught the bug, yeah. Basically. Um, boxing's fully my dad. Like, my dad used to take me boxing as a kid. Um, and I've just always followed the sport since then. And again, football was just something that I watched on TV once. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can <clears throat> follow this. And then I started going to like local games. So my very first game was at Old Trafford against Cholton. Oh, wow. um, and I think I couldn't have been any older than eight back then. But then when we moved down here, it was like, OK, let's start. When I was old enough, I started going like with my friends to watch local games. So I think my first game down here was watching Grey's Athletic when I was like 12. And then we won a trip to Roots Hall. We'd done like a stadium tour of Roots Hall with the school. And they was doing a promotion, which was kids for a quid. So wow, me and a few mates went up there, paid a pound, watched a South End game, and I've been hooked ever since. I've been... I just love the journey of going from Old Trafford to Grey's Athletic. Yeah, it kind of went what backwards. Am I, what am I <laughs> <laughs> it kind of went the wrong way. Um, yeah. I kind of wish I'd done Old Trafford last, but... Like, like a football you know. player in decline. <laughs> Basically, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I presume, I presume, if you're a tennis fan, uh, you must have watched the Emma Raducanu. Oh yeah, match. hundred percent. I mean that. I mean, I watched that. I thought, like, oh wow, wow, I wow, wow. The, I missed match of the day to watch her finish her game, and that says a lot. That's dedication. Chelsea yeah. had won that day. Lukaku scored two, so I was, <laughs> and I knew that. So yeah, it's, but it was yeah. I, I, again, I like tennis. I, I, I'm, I literally just watch U.S. Open and Wimbledon. Yeah. Can't play massively into it. Just the probably your more casual um, spectator, but yeah, she was she was blinding. I mean, the fact that they're both there, one eighty, one ninety. Yeah, that's it. It felt like you're watching the future, didn't it? Really, it felt like you're watching the future of tennis. Yeah. What about like gaming? Who got us into gaming? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, mine, I think, as I said before, my earliest memory is my dad my older brother and my older sister, I I could only have been like one. And they're all sitting around playing Super Nintendo. They're playing Super Mario Bros. 3. And yeah, it was just, I just remember them watching that. And I was like, oh, when I'm old enough, I want to play that. And yeah, yeah it kind of just stemmed from that into now I'm a massive nerd. So Yeah, I, I think mine was um, the, uh, the N64. My cousins used to have one. And I come, I just remember coming downstairs. It felt like really late, but I was only young. So it's probably like 10 o'clock at night. And my mum was sat there on the sofa and she was playing um, Super Mario on there, uh, where you've got to collect the 150 stars through jumping through the paint. Oh, jeez. And um, yeah, I, I got that, got that game myself. I ended up, my cousins all into it, all playing those sorts of games. Before you know it, you're getting towards um secondary school everyone's pretty much playing runescape and everyone's playing all these online games oh yeah I back in the good old days be, gonna be missed out when it was free not yeah. paid so you, you got into those got into runescape and then everyone then the call of duty days come out where everyone was rushing home to go swear at some kid in america online <laughs> yep. um and then, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It's just, I think, feel like if you're our age now, we're probably the first generation that uh, we're adults are into gaming because we've grown up with it. We're a whole generation that was brought up on on gaming compared to previous generations. Yeah, and I feel like definitely. it's slowly becoming socially more acceptable for people approaching 30 to still be gaming. So I'm uh, yeah. definitely going to make the most of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm proud of that. I'm proud to fit in that age gap. Yeah, no, I think for me, the one I think it is mainly, I, I got console when I was very young to keep me kind of concentrating and just like do me something like that. But I didn't really get into it until I was about, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, mm. uh, because I was doing like a history thing. And I just kind of kept the knowledge without like knowing how I did it kind of thing. And I just kept doing it and I just keep doing it now kind of thing. And it was mainly because of one guy called Chris Boris from Irate Gamer. But, um, who I think some people know is like the, was the rival to AVGN and did an angry video game there with like um, which is James Rolfe, but they're now like really good friends and stuff. But no, I mean 
mine's i think it's just took a lot longer but i've had a console for a very long time but it's just i didn't get into gaming until probably a, a lot later i just yeah. did it as a hobby i am um, i'm gonna have to shoot off i will end on we'll end on one end one antidote for it's quite interesting we're talking about gaming Go on. when i was when i was in college i was doing uh, an as in sociology and in my first exam i got an f and uh, so i basically needed to get like a, a high b or an a in my next one to average out at a c um and I, at the time i was playing pez over fifa it was that Brilliant. weird year when everyone played pez yeah but they did this thing on the game where it let you edit the player names and the team names because they didn't have the right the right um, names. oh right. yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know which one. Yeah. so i changed all I, as part of my homework i changed all of the player names to um famous people throughout history related to each of the um sociology subjects i changed oh, the team God. names to I changed the team names to like Marxism and whatever else, and like I'd have like Howard Becker as one of the players, and on their stats you could put their ages and dates and information. And from just playing Pez alone, I knew that when it comes to an exam, they were like name someone's theorist within Marxism. Um, I was able to rattle off like four or five pl like players in my head because I with football and with FIFA I can remember stats, names, players like yeah. you couldn't believe. So by applying it to this game, I managed to get an A on my next one and actually level out and C at my AS. And then I that thought, is actually amazing. <laughs> oh, no, I thought I'm not going to push my luck, so I dropped it then and, and carried on with my, the rest of my, uh, oh. my studies. But it just shows you, doesn't it? It's, if gaming, it's it's got its uses, but oh yeah, so gaming oh, yeah. is oh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's I'm not, not that. on that on that bombshell. I'm going to have to uh, to to love you and leave you. But no, it's, thank it's, you it's, so much for being involved. All right. Brilliant. All right, take care. You too. We'll speak to you soon. Yep. Right, we have only got two quick questions question left, left anyway. Uh, well, yeah, we've got what, uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is, yep. what would you do if you were locked down in a haunted location? Uh, what would you do if you were locked down in a haunted location? I would cry and call for my mum. <laughs> Probably the same. Um, I'd just like keep an air in, just probably on my own i'll just keep my ears out but i would probably just keep my eyes out and just don't sleep basically uh yeah. last one i've been looking forward to this one uh what would your dream match be in regards to wrestling shall i start before yeah like, you go, go into quite detail okay i don't wrestle i should just let it play to people i don't wrestle but man would i love to uh you know who wouldn't but um i think one in particular i think it's about two and uh, like two Names that come up in my head, uh, or one I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, actually, no, three. One being Osprey. Yep. Will Osprey. I mean, who wouldn't? He's Essex born anyway, so I'm Essex. Essex and Essex. Can't go wrong with that. Um, two, the one that just lost the title in NWA. I've forgotten his name. British oh, boy. Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis. I mean, yeah. who wouldn't? I mean, he's quite, he's actually un so underrated. One of the best wrestlers never go to WWE. And the because I know you're a wrestler, probably you as well. Just because I know you and it will be just a fun little thing. Yeah, that's true. That would be a good one, actually. I mean, yeah. But, I mean, again, again, I have no experience. It would never happen. We'll change that. But <laughs> I tell you what. So I've got a few. Some are more realistic than others. Um, yeah. One I've already ticked off, which back in, I want to say 2018, I got to wrestle James Mason, which... Ooh, nice. Obviously, he's done SmackDown, he's done Impact, and yeah, I got to wrestle him in Southampton, which was massive for me. Um, Daniel Bryan, or Bryan Danielson, I'd love to get one-on-one -on -one with him. Obviously, again, Osprey, growing up with him, um, doing a lot of RCWA with him, I'd love to get that one-on-one -on -one match with him now. I've just thought of another one, I've just thought of, I'll just crop it in. Uh, on, ben Carter on. slash Nathan Fraser. yeah. I mean, I, I, I love, I mean, he's a good guy. Good guy as well. Um, yeah, Brian Danielson, Osprey. I would love... One that I think is quite realistic and should be happening. Oh, there's two that should happen by the end of next year. Uh, Johnny Storm and Doug Williams. Ooh. I'd love to take both of them on. And one that I think would surprise everyone that listens to this, and it's been a dream match of mine for years is oh my god his name's just completely gone from me nigel mcginnis i would absolutely oh, yeah. give anything for nigel mcginnis to come out of retirement and wrestle me 
I would yeah. I would pay an unlimited yes. sum yeah, of yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, He's a great commentator. Yeah. I like I do like his commentating. His work in the early days of Ring of Honor as the pure champion and as a world champion is so underrated. And because it was in such early days, I feel like it's overlooked a lot. But honestly, yeah. if Nigel McGuinness never retired, he would quite possibly be one of the best British wrestlers of all time. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I'd like to make all of them come true. A lot of them more realistic than others, but it, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see where the road takes us. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah, believe no. that is just about all we've got time for anyway. One hectic, hectic one. I'll be honest, I'm amazed if this isn't put into two parts we'll see. <laughs> because of it. <laughs> but yeah, one bumper episode. Obviously, I want to thank yourself. I want to thank yeah. Regan, Spencer, Spencer and Ellis. All great guys yeah. and all brought some amazing points and conversation to the podcast yeah. as well. Agreed. But yeah, I certainly think we've got one great growing esports family, which Agreed. I'm beyond happy about. So yeah, until next time, this is either going to be episode three, 3.2 3. or 10, <laughs> depending on how many parts it goes in. Um, yep. I've been John. I'm still here with the amazing Larry. And we will see you all for the next episode very soon. Oh,